Welcome to Fish Casting, the podcast. I'm your host, Tanner of Fish Facts TV. Hey, everybody. I'm Captain Strip. Uh, you can call me Captain Tim. All right. We got a lot to cover in today's podcast. We're going to talk about what we've been catching this week. Uh, we're going to talk about the fish of the week. And we got some great um, user questions. And we just want to say we're, we're so appreciative of all the new listeners and subscribers uh, we've been getting. So just keep giving us those five stars on iTunes or Spotify and keep telling all your friends. You know, I think we're mostly word of mouth at this point. So tell all your friends and help us to get up. All right. So uh, let's get into our first segment. Tim, what have you been catching? So uh, for those that tuned in last week, I, I noted that there were a couple tropical systems that were approaching the Gulf of Mexico, and I was a little concerned with them. Um, obviously, if you're, uh, unless you're living under a rock, you may have seen or heard of Hurricane Laura, Tropical Storm Marco that have been out in the Gulf of Mexico. So last weekend, I was going to use that time um, in order to, to prep just in case we got a storm here on the west coast of Florida. Well, lucky for us, the, the storms decided to go further west and um, impact Texas, Louisiana, those areas. So uh, I kind of made my bed and I didn't have a chance to go offshore, but I was able to sneak over to my parents' house and do a little backwater tarpon and snook fishing. So uh, my parents live on a backwater canal of Tampa Bay that holds a very fine fishery for juvenile tarpon. Uh, most of these tarpon are in the three to five pound range, so they're very small, but we do see some up to maybe 15 or 20 pounds. Um, so I went over there. Uh, I wanted to pick up a couple entries into the Coastal Conservation Association of Florida's STAR Tournament. Tanner, are you familiar with that STAR Tournament by any chance? You know, I've heard a little bit about it, but please tell me more. So the STAR tournament is a tournament that you uh, you submit pictures into in a number of different divisions. Uh, the main division is a tagged redfish division where they have some awesome prizes from different boats to some really cool stuff where if you catch one of these tagged redfish, you can submit the picture, clip the tag, release the redfish, and be eligible to win, you know, boats that are, are in, you know, close to $100,000 range. So a really cool tournament to enter. The proceeds obviously go to a, a great association, the Coastal Conservation Association. There's a number of them in the Southeast. Uh, this one I was participating in, I'm currently participating in, is for the state of Florida. It's roughly 100 days of fishing. Um, like I said, there's so many different divisions from pails of trash to tarpon, the fly division, kayak, snook, trout, redfish, mahi-mahi, grouper. So there are so many, and anytime I go out, if you catch a fish of legal keeping size, you can submit it into this tournament, which gives you entries. And then at the end of the tournament, there is a random drawing and you can win some other really cool prizes. So I wanted so, to pick up a couple. Wait a second. Carpen and uh, yes, sir. Oh, so all you have to do is submit a picture and you can get into this tournament. So there is a small fee. Uh, you have to be a CCA member, which is about $35 per year. And then you have to enter the tournament. I think the tournament is $30 uh, for the year for the tournament. It really runs 100 days, but it's roughly for everything, $65. All the money goes to a great cause. And uh, they, they put on um, some, they have some really cool prizes. And it also helps with uh, of scientists do fish surveys. They can see where you've been catching the fish, what you use to catch the fish, if the fish was harvested, how it was hooked, et cetera. So it's pretty cool. The data goes to science to help figure out patterning fish and you know sustainability levels. And all the money goes to support the Coastal Conservation Association. Wow, that's really awesome. I uh, might have to look into that myself. Yeah, I, I would recommend it. Uh, obviously, this, this year's tournament's already started, but the cool thing about the tournament is you can enter at any time and start submitting pictures. So it's pretty neat. So anyways, yeah. I was uh, trying to pick up some tarpon. I wanted to, I wanted to catch a couple tarpon for this uh, tournament. Um, the tarpon uh, category, there's not a ton of entries generally. Um, you seem to get a lot for snook and things like that, but tarpon, especially fly fishing for tarpon, there's not a lot of entries. 
Um, it doesn't matter the size of the tarpon. It could be a 150 pound tarpon or it could be a five pound tarpon. Each entry is worth the same amount. So I was really trying to catch some of these juvenile tarpon. Um, I, brought the, I brought the fly rod. I also um, brought a really light spin fishing setup. Um, I, I just did the spin fishing setup this week. Uh, I didn't end up catching any, but I jumped about half a dozen of them. So I was fishing in my parents' backyard, which is a backwater canal lined with mangroves. Uh, and I was using swim baits, using very light tackle, uh, just trying to catch some of these tarpon. Um, so my technique was, was, like I said, using swim baits with 14 pound test fluorocarbon, 10 pound mainline, small spin fishing outfits, throwing up and, up and down the mangrove lines trying to get these tarpon to eat. Got a lot of fish to roll up on and, and strike the bait. Hooked probably half a dozen of them. They shook the hook, unfortunately, so I couldn't get any entries. But also had a, a nice snook about 30 inches, eat my bait. And uh, like I said, I was using very light tackle. Battled her in for a while. She ended up breaking me off right at the dock because I was using such light tackle. But, but that's pretty much all I got to do this weekend as far as fishing. Um, I spent about an hour out there, had a great time, um, spent some time in the pool. But this upcoming weekend, I'm hoping to get out. We'll, we'll see how much energy is left in the Gulf of Mexico after these storms go by because uh, with that much uh, wind and, and rain and energy out there, we could feel the effects for uh, at least a, a week or two just of all the, all the washing machine style water that's kind of bouncing around out there don't want to get caught offshore in that. It's, it's not a whole lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you took the safe option, staying inshore and um, just kind of doing something really enjoyable. Now, you said there were mangroves growing. So this is a brackish water canal? So yeah, it's, uh, it, it's up in the, um, I guess it'd be the western part of Tampa Bay, technically like northeast St. Petersburg. Um, it is brackish water. It's, it's truly a runoff canal that leads to Placido Bayou, which is a part of Tampa Bay. So people that are familiar with Tampa Bay might know the area I'm talking about. Um, and if you have been back there, you know how beautiful it is. Just the tree is amazing. Um, snook, redfish, tarpon, uh, you never know what you'll see back there. But where I was at uh, was, was way back on this backwater canal in three feet deep water just up against the mangroves when it rains the water flushes through there like you mentioned it was a brackish water canal but the juvenile tarpon and snook they just pile in there so it's a it's a really nice spot to fish it's very peaceful you kind of forget that you're in a, a st petersburg or even close to to a larger city it, it could be a slice of the everglades back there that sounds like a lot of fun. I, I got to get up there with you uh, next time I'm in Tampa, you know. Tarpon and snook are two fish that seem to uh, consistently evade um, my tactics, uh, you know, in general. I'll, I'll get one every now and then, but it sounds like you're uh, basically a pro over there in the Tampa St. Pete area. I get some. This last week they eluded me, these little guys, but uh, they're, they're tough to catch because they're so acrobatic and they're they jump and they shake their head and no matter what you can do sometimes, uh, they just throw the hook. But it's a whole lot of fun seeing those little guys jump around and attack your small swim baits on light tackle. So it was fun either way. Uh, I always learn something every time I go out and target those little guys. So um, now I know for next time and, and I'll, I'll have to switch up my tactics a little bit. Absolutely. Did you get out and do any fishing this week? What have you caught? So actually, um, because of this whole work from home thing, I've been trying to get out a lot of mornings. So I've, I can't even remember the last time I talked to you. I want to say I've gone out three or four times, um, mostly just quick morning trips. I got one full boat day, um, but it was a slow day. So I actually caught more on some of my quick morning trips um, than I did. So I guess I'll just kind of knock out the boat day and then just kind of breeze through some of my other trips. So boat day was on Thursday. Um, I was really hoping to get some either some deep water snapper or muttons. Um, it was windy here all weekend. So uh, I guess it was, the boat day was on Friday. So Friday was really the only day uh, we could have taken the boat out. And we got the boat out. Things started out pretty good. It seemed like a nice day. 
you got a lot of bait, but the fish just weren't biting. You know, I, I caught a bunch of ballyhoo and I was trying squid. I was trying all sorts of different stuff. Wasn't getting anything. Um, the guy I was with pulled a nice porgy off the bottom. We were in about 75 feet fishing uh, artificial wrecks off Miami. Um, I started chunking up ballyhoo, hoping to maybe get on some yellowtails. And I hooked into something and man, did it pull. And it turns out it was about a, I don't know, 16, 17, 18 inch mutton snapper. I did not have my ruler. I put it on a Facebook group and everybody told me it was 16. I thought it looked 18, but with an abundance of caution, I let it go. But like I said last week, I want to get a nice mutton. And regardless, that was still one of the biggest muttons I've ever caught. I've never caught a ton of keepers. So even if it was an inch or two too short, or if it was just barely a keeper, it was still a blast. And I was, I got it on a 15 pound leader with 20 pound line. So like you fishing super light tackle, no weight, just on a yellowtail jig back in the chum line. So a fish at that size, even if it wasn't a keeper, put up quite a fight. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I can imagine that that a, a good size mutton pulling off the chun like that uh, could definitely give you a, a quite a tussle. So I'm glad that you're able to catch your target species. You know, you went out looking for a mutton and you got one. So that that's awesome, Tan. That's that's really cool. Good job. Yeah. Now I'll quickly breeze through some of my my short little uh, mini trips. I'll I'll start calling them. So one of the trips actually talking about backwater tarpon. I saw a backwater tarpon, but I couldn't get it to bite. Um, I was back, I went over to Bass Pro to pick up some stuff and just decided to stop by this spillway I know uh, in the Everglades, fully fresh water um, on my way back from Bass Pro. So cast there for a little while. I caught a little Oscar. I don't know if you know them. They're a freshwater uh, South American fish. I caught a Mayan cichlid and I caught a peacock bass and I saw a probably 30, 40 pound tarpon rolling in the spillway, 100% fresh water in the Everglades, 13 miles um, up from the main saltwater intercoastal or bay in Miami. I threw everything I could at it, would not hit anything. In retrospect, I wish I would have tried to throw that Mayan cichlid out there because it just didn't seem to want, it seemed like all the baits that I had were just a little bit too small for it. Yeah, uh, you know, in hindsight, that might have been a good play. It, it, you said it's 13 miles up uh, and fully fresh water. You know, he's got to be up there eating on those things. You know, they got to eat. So um, trying something a little different, uh, a different approach with, with the local fish that they're feeding on, that, that could have done it. You know, you never know. You never know. And so the next penny trip, did I tell you about South Beach when we were on here last week? I can't remember. No, I don't think we talked about South Beach. We talked about government cut uh, and the jetty, but I don't think we got to South Beach. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was the jetty. That's the same trip. So okay. that, that, was, that was last Tuesday. So this Tuesday, this morning, um, I went out to Card Sound. Like uh, I remember I also told you last week, right near Alabama Jacks. And there's a few little bridges. It, it, it's like creeks where it runs from Card Sound into the bay north of Key Largo. And I've seen some of them, one of them I'd seen mangroves. I got some really nice live shrimp and decided to see if I could find any mangroves. And sure enough, I did. Um, on the first cast, I got a keeper mangrove, um, probably caught about nine or 10 keepers total. Uh, the bigger ones I was actually getting, I bought a couple pinfish to try to throw for snook. I didn't see any snook, but I started cutting those pinfish in half and pulled out a couple 13, 14 inch mangroves, probably caught 40 total. So, you know, the, the ratio of big ones to small ones wasn't great, but the action was hot. You know, if you dropped in a little tiny quarter shrimp or anything, you know, you were going to get a bite. Cool. Now, as, as we've talked about before on different episodes, you know, I, I know you explore and, and constantly try to find new ground, new area to fish. So that's another one to put in your book. Uh, and, and that's great. I'm, I'm happy you were able to get out and find a new spot, especially catch not only for fish for the table, but you caught so many. The action was hot and, and the, the fish bite was constant. So that's pretty awesome. Good job. Absolutely. Now, what about upcom this upcoming week? Do you have any uh, fish plans? 
Yeah, so I don't, I don't really know right now. Uh, um, I keep going back and forth. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking and, and tossing around the idea of potentially going out um, maybe 30 or so miles. I haven't been offshore since uh, maybe three weeks ago when I, when I got those, those nice red grouper and snapper. I'd really like to get out there, but um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, that just with those hurricanes out there, just the residual effects of the, of the waves that can be out there and, and everything stirred up. I know we didn't get a direct hit, not even close here, but the Gulf of Mexico is pretty contained and it takes a long time for all that energy to die out. So I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm monitoring a number of different forecasting apps that I use, um, but I'm, I'm thinking probably maybe 25% I'll make it offshore. But I like to try to go inshore here if I don't make it out. Um, probably back to, to hanging out with the family on the sandbar and maybe fish a couple of docks for snook and, and, and try to pick up some, some entries into that star tournament and, and catch a couple nice snooks. So we'll see. We'll see. Do you have anything on the plate for the upcoming week? Um, you know, I'll probably try to scout out some new spots in the mornings like I've been doing. But I have the boat on Thursday. So Thursday's a full day. Uh, depending on how the weather looks, I think right now it's marginal. If we're inshore, I'm going to be going to Stiltsville, probably just targeting mangrove snapper. Um, there's just not a lot you can do inshore in Miami until the mullet really start to come in. And I think we're still a couple weeks away from that. And, you know, so I go jogging right around downtown every morning and I have my eye on those mullet because when the mullet come in, the snook and the tarpon come in. But right now I haven't been seeing any mullet. So we're hoping we can go offshore and chase the dolphin. And then if the dolphin aren't there, we're going to try to drift for muttons in a little bit deeper water than we were last week. Um, but if it's not nice, I'm going to be headed out to Stiltsville, which is an outer part of the bay uh, in Miami where there's a bunch of old houses on stilts. You know, there's a lot of snapper there. A lot of them aren't that big, but you can chum there and it's consistent action. Um, but other than that, you know, I don't know if I want to run south because we have it all day. I could technically try to run south into the bay to go chase permit on the flats, but I just don't really know how to do that type of fishing. And especially when I'm with two or three guys um, that are friends of mine that don't that haven't fished too much, it might be a lot to push for those permit uh, if I am stuck in shore. Yeah, it, it's always tough when, when you have guests on board, uh, especially guests that you either don't know their skill level um, or you know don't have a lot of experience doing things. I know as a captain, uh, even when I'm out with my friends and family, I have this, uh, this want, you know, you're always driving to put people on fish and you always feel like it's a direct representation of you as a, a captain or a fisherman that if you do have a tough bite, it just adds that extra layer. Um, so I, I understand, I feel your pain. Um, maybe, maybe not with some uh, semi-novice anglers, you know, uh, get out there and try it. You know, maybe, maybe you got to go solo or, or, you know, maybe, as, as we've talked about in the past, if you can meet someone that's done it before, you know, and, and just they're willing to spread that local knowledge, that would be probably the ticket. Yeah, we'll have to see. If, I, if I'm in shore all day, what, what, maybe I'll try to do both and, you know, run down for a couple hours in the morning and just drift the flats with a crab. And if that doesn't work, you know, put them on a the little snapper where I know I can catch them um, just to give them some action. Yep. All right, um, the next segment we want to do is the fish of the week, the hogfish or hog snapper, Lachnolimus maximus. I'll give it to you first, Tim. Yeah, so the, the hog snapper, as it's commonly referred to, is not actually a snapper, and I, I know you're going to talk about that too, so I won't spoil your thunder there. Um, I'll just touch on a little bit of my history with the fish and the fishery itself. Uh, I, I can really speak to the west central range of Florida on the Gulf Coast. Um, you know, growing up here, hogfish was one of those fish that if it didn't have a hole in the side of it from a spear shaft where a spear fisherman shot it, you know, you were questioning how it, that it got on your plate. Um, they, they were one of those species that it was 99% primarily harvested by spear fishermen. So maybe about 10 years ago or so, the, the uh, hook and line folks kind of figured it out. And, and up until maybe 
six years ago for myself, um, I hadn't even tried to target them. Um, what, what I do for them now is I use, use a light tackle. You'll hear, you'll keep hearing me echoing light tackle, pretty much everything I fish for, um, light tackle, jig heads, knocker rigs, um, you know, maybe 20, 25 pound test line, and I'll bring out 30 or 40 dozen shrimp offshore. I'll target, um, those hard bottom ledges. Uh, we talked before about those prehistoric shorelines. This a little different from the Swiss cheese I mentioned in episode one, but there's these big uh, limestone rock ledges that the hogfish cruise up and down on. Um, I don't target them in the summertime. Um, my favorite time to target the hogfish is, is actually when they're gearing up to spawn. So uh, the, the hogfish, when I like to target them, is really November through February. The water gets cooler. I find high concentrations of these hogfish anywhere from 40 feet of water out to 80 feet of water up along these, these ledges. So we'll spend, you know, two hours in these ledges and you'll catch a hundred grunts, a hundred porgies, all sorts of fish before these hogfish eat sometimes. It's just a matter of being patient. They root around in the sand for crustaceans. So I bring out, like I said, 30 or 40 dozen shrimp, sometimes maybe even 10 dozen frozen shrimp. I use those frozen ones first to weed through all of the, uh, Porgies and the grunts, and then I'll drop down the fresh shrimp. I, I generally have way better luck for the hogfish on the fresh shrimp, but they're a heck of a lot of fun to catch. Um, very easy to spear. I've speared tons of them too, but they're one of my favorite fish to target in the wintertime when things like grouper are closed. Um, I, I just really like targeting them. They, they put up a great fight, and they're one of the best eating fish that you can catch. That's really interesting the way you weed through the grunts like that. I, I've never really heard of that, that type of fishing, but that's, that's a really awesome tactic. Yeah, the, the grunts are just more aggressive. I find that, you know, the grunts are, are way more aggressive and they, they attack your bait first thing and the hogfish are a little more shy. They're, they're not the first one to your bait when it gets to the bottom. So you catch a couple dozen grunts. Um, and then you maybe get a hog. And there's, there's something that, you know, my, my uh, fishing buddies and I like to say when we're targeting hogfish that I've never caught a hogfish without catching a grunt first. <laughs> so uh, if you're in the grunts, if you're in the porries, that's a good sign. Keep at it. Uh, don't lose faith. It can be an hour. It can be two hours. Keep finding those baits down. You'll probably get one. And, and if you don't, now you know for next time. It's just <laughs> you got to keep after it. <laughs> that's how we learn. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like a lot of fun. Um, I personally don't have a ton of experience with hogfish. Um, like you were saying, they're not a member of the snapper family, as is commonly thought. They're a member of the wrasse family, um, which is a, a pretty widely distributed family of fish. I know when I was in American Samoa, we used to catch these fish called Napoleon wrasse, which actually look very similar to hogfish, um, but they, those get to be, I believe, around 100 pounds. Um, hogfish live around the Caribbean area, um, and like some other wrasse, I know when I lived in New York, we used to catch blackfish or tautog. Um, we also catch the pudding wife that we mentioned last week. So the wrasse family is a pretty big mm -hmm. cosmopolitan family. Um, like you were saying, most people shoot them. Um, I've caught a handful of them in the Keys. I think I've caught one in Miami fishing off a pier. I caught a little tiny baby one. Um, but last year during lobster season, my cousin shot one. So that was the last time I ate um, uh, hogfish. And I just have to say, hogfish to me is one of the best eating fish out there. I don't know why the meat is just like this white, firm taste. And by golly, it is delicious. Yeah, it, it's definitely one of the best. And, and while I'm thinking about it, I just want to add something to any of the listeners that maybe want to go out and, and try to catch these hogfish. Um, a couple of years ago, the, the limit was changed um, from 12 inches to the fork to 14 inches to the fork. And I think it's a direct reflection on the hook and line fishermen getting in the, in the game. Here on the Gulf Coast, we can keep up to five per person per day. In the Keys and in the Atlantic, I think you get one per person per day. But, but something to consider is whenever I'm hog fishing, I don't keep any of the female hog fish. So the one male can service a number of females. Um, I don't like keeping the females, especially if we're you know, going out and getting our limit. I try to target those males. Um, it's not really targeting, wrong, wrong choice of word, but 
I only try to keep the male hogfish. And the funny thing about hogfish, like a number of fish, is they change sexes as they get older. Um, they start out as females and then grow into males. So generally the fish that you want to keep that are of legal keeping size are those males. I recommend you look at pictures before you go out targeting these fish because the males look very different from the females. Both have kind of an ugly elegance to them. They're, they're definitely a, quite a unique looking fish, but do yourself a favor and, and try to protect the fishery best you can. Harvest those males, let the females go, let them spawn and, and produce more of these really tasty fish. Yeah, that's, that's a really awesome and, um, you know, appreciate the small steps in conservation can really make uh, a big difference down the road. All right, well, our last segment, um, we're gonna go over questions. This week, we had a ton of great questions. We're gonna limit it to two a week. I think we're already starting to run um, about time, so we'll try to keep this short. Um, and the first question we're getting is from R. Harrison Golden. And hold on, let me look up um, his question so I, I get you exactly what his language was. He said, well, I'm gonna need how, that. <laughs> he said, how bad does the weather need to be to keep you from going out fishing? That's a good one. Uh, you mind if I tackle this one first? Uh? Absolutely, jump on it. Okay, so that, that one's arbitrary. Um, you know, as an offshore fisherman, as a nearshore fisherman, as an inshore fisherman, and as we heard already in this episode, I, I fish offshore, uh, off the shore, excuse me, as well. So my general um, limits for offshore fishing is I play the wind more than anything. I don't mind fishing in the rain. We, you know, living in Florida, we do get these really bad thunderstorms, but I'm more concerned with the wind and how it's going to affect the the swells and the waves offshore. So if I'm going to run offshore and I and I classify offshore as 30 plus miles out, I'm probably not going to go if it's anywhere close to 15 knots of wind. Um, and that's just the limit that I set for myself and my boat. Um, if I'm going to go, uh, you know, try try doing anything near shore, you know, if it's if I got a really hot hogfish spot that I know, you know, is at 15 miles and I want to go catch some of those. Um, you know, I might push it, you know, if it's up over 15, I might, you know, say, hey, wife, you might want to stay home this time. I'm going to grab the boys. We're going to go. It's going to be sporty. And then, you know, if it gets any more than that, I'm, I'm going to stay probably inshore, you know, fish some of the uh, docks I have. Um, or, you know, the option is to fish my parents' dock for tarpon, which is awesome. Or, you know, there's, there's spots to wade. There's, there's spots you can fish from shore as well, kind of like what you do a lot of. So, I know that I didn't answer that question very well because there's just so many different variables. Um, but uh, I, I would not go fishing in one of these hurricanes that's uh, aiming at the, the Texas, Louisiana coast. If that's uh, um, a finite enough answer for you, then, then, then that would be it. How about you, Tanner? Well, I, I think Harrison, the guy who asked the question, actually lives in New Orleans. So the, that's probably what he had on his mind uh, when he asked it. Um, but for me, I. I think you hit most of the nails on the head. It is always subjective, but 15 knots of wind is a good threshold for boat fishing. Um, small craft advisory is another good threshold for boat fishing. Um, you know, Noah gives these small craft advisories, which basically said, if you have a small craft, which most boats that people listening to this podcast probably have, shouldn't go out. I know uh, the boat club I'm in also uses that small craft advisory. Um, I've had a couple experiences where I pushed uh, the limit. One time I was in the Keys with my dad, we were down there for a week and it was a small craft advisory every day. And so on the last day, we wanted to get out in the blue water and we looked at each other and we said, all right, we're gonna try it. We get a mile and a half offshore and we cavitate the prop. Um, totally out of the water and that's kind of what sealed it for me. Small craft advisory, probably should stay inside. Another time with my dad, um, we got into the dolphin left and right, pulling them out right off the keys, one after another, and we see a storm coming. But we are so into catching these fish one after another, we don't really keep a good eye on the storm. And we ended up having to go right through the middle of it to get back. But I guess we never would have gone fishing 
um, in that storm. And then the last story I want to talk about is when it, there's another threshold of when it gets the length of time since I last fish. So I'm willing to fish in worse weather. Like if I just fished yesterday and the weather's bad, I'm not going to fish. Um, a couple months ago, we had a holiday weekend. It was a three day weekend. I really wanted to fish and it rained all weekend long. So finally on Monday, I hadn't fished in probably two weeks. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go fishing. My wife was like, you know, Tanner, it's supposed to rain all day long. And I was like, well, you know, I'll wear my raincoat. I'll figure something out. And sure enough, it started raining so hard. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Miami River, but like most urban rivers, there's seawalls on either side of it in the downtown area. Mm -hmm. It was raining so hard, water was coming over the seawall like a <laughs> waterfall into the river. And, you know, during the terrible part of the storm, the fish weren't really biting, but we did end up pulling out five or six mangroves and a couple nice jacks uh, later on that afternoon. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think we're both uh, um, in agreement where safety plays a, a critical role in, in any decision I make uh, and you make as well. You know, there's something I like to tell some friends of mine that, that I take out fishing is that there's too many nice days to go out in one of those really, really nasty days. And uh, I am familiar with the Miami River. I, I lived on a, a yacht at the Fifth Street Marina for a couple months uh, on the Miami River. And yeah, it, it, yeah, not not my favorite spot in the world. But, uh. <laughs> hey, you know, there's a lot of snapper, and in the coming months, hopefully, a lot of snook and uh, tarpon too. Oh yeah. All right. Next question. So the next question is actually kind of a retread of our question last week. We thought the requester AJ Devs was asking us a hundred mile or a thousand miles, but he meant a thousand square miles, which would be a hundred mile radius. So I apologize for misreading that, but I think it opens up a hotter debate. So I will kick it off. I'll, let's just say a hundred mile radius. And for me, I, I think it might be marathon, middle keys. <laughs> um, you know, you can still barely get to Miami. You can still get to the lower keys within a hundred miles, you know, you can still get up to Florida Bay, um, do a lot of snook fishing, um, tuna, basically everything to me is within a hundred miles of marathon. Um, I think that hundred miles kind of takes out the New Orleans argument. Yes, there's a lot of great inshore fishing within a hundred miles of New Orleans, but you can't do inshore and offshore fishing. You're really gonna have to go more than a hundred miles to get out to Venice. Uh, or to get out to those big rigs that are holding the mm -hmm. tuna. Um, and, you know, just growing up in Jacksonville, yeah, there's some pretty good fishing within 100 miles of Jacksonville. But I, if I was limited to one place for the rest of my life, I just don't think it would be Jack's. Well, uh, you were thinking that it was going to be a debate, but uh, <laughs> I think I would choose somewhere along the, the Florida, uh, you know, Keys Reef Tract as well. Um, whether it be, you know, further south or excuse me, further west, it would be closer down to Key West. Um, so maybe you could go out and hit Pulley Ridge or the Tortugas or uh, any of that area or, you know, maybe further east. And, and that way you could either bump out to some of the deep water off Miami, Lauderdale. Um, but but I think I think you hit the nail on the head, you know, somewhere in the middle keys where you can stretch it north, south, east, west. And there's so many different fisheries, you know, the backwater fishing of, of the 10,000 islands in Florida Bay. You got the, the amazing inshore reefs and patch reefs and stuff like that through the Keys. And then you got the blue water fishing, deep drop fishing, and you never know what you're gonna get down on, off the stream down there. So I, I would have to agree. I know we want to debate on this one, but uh, <laughs> um, there's always next week, I guess, huh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, you mentioned the dry tortugas. Have you ever fished the dry tortugas before? Uh, I haven't done a whole lot of fishing down there. I've, I've passed through that area on a number of different boats I've been on, but haven't um, truly targeted for fishing. Um, it, it's one of those things that hopefully one of these days I'll, uh, I'll get down there, but um, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, that's, that's something. They do some overnight head boat trips for mm -hmm. like 200 bucks and they just catch tons of massive muttons and, uh, you yeah. know, 
if 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 I stay in Florida, I, I'm going to go down there and do that uh, one of these days. Yeah, they they, they do um, a lot of cool trips. Uh, e either just sightseeing over over um, touring the fort, or yeah, like you said, some of these fishing trips. I think Yankee Captains is one of the major outfits that goes down there, and they have great reviews. From what I understand, and then they put so yeah, give it a shot. You're you're not too far from there. I think it's about eight hours for me, probably. What, two and a half, three for you? Yeah, shouldn't be too bad. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, we recorded this on Tuesday evening. Um, I have some other stuff to do, so I probably won't get it up until Wednesday afternoon. But uh, again, submit your questions. Fishfactsdaily at gmail.com. TV on Instagram. Yeah, and you can find me um, at Captain Strip on Instagram. Uh, just put a nice picture of the snook on there today. So check it out. Uh, like, subscribe to the podcast, whatever you guys want to do, and uh, keep those questions coming. All right. Thanks. See you guys next time. Thank you.